Good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. This is Dr. Nicole Lurie. I'm the former Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at HHS and co-chair of the advisory group for this webinar series, alongside uh, Dr. Carlos Del Rio of Emory University, and we're both thrilled to be here. Welcome to the fourth webinar on the COVID-19 conversation series brought to you by the National Academy of Medicine and the American Public Health Association. The purpose of this series is to explore the state of the science on COVID-19 and to inform policymakers, public health and healthcare professionals, scientists, business leaders, and the public. More information on the series and recordings of past webinars are available at the covid19conversations.org website. Today's webinar has been approved for 1.5 continuing education credits for CHES, CME, and CPH. None of the speakers has any relevant financial relationships to disclose. Please note that if you want continuing education credit, you should have registered with your first and last name. Everyone who wants credit must have their own registration. All of the participants today will receive an email within a few days from cpd at confex.com with information about claiming those credits. If you have questions, or topics you'd like to address today or in any future webinars, please enter them in a Q&A box or email us at APHA at APHA.org. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please enter your questions in the box. Please pay attention to the chat for announcements about how to troubleshoot. They'll probably come up early and often. This webinar will be recorded and the recording, transcript and slides will be available also on covidconversations.org. Before I introduce our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Gostin, I thought I might just make a quick remark about uh, how I spent my day uh, the day before yesterday. In back-to-back -back calls, I was on a call first with all the hospitals in New York City who were talking about taking care of COVID patients in ICUs who would develop kidney failure and they were talking about the fact that they were out of dialysis machines, they were out of dialysis fluids, and they didn't have enough nurses. And so they weren't able to offer dialysis uh, for patients who were sick in their ICUs and who they thought were very likely to get better. An hour later, I was on a call with fellows at an Indian reservation in South Dakota. And South Dakota, as you know, is an emerging hotspot for COVID. These fellows were telling me that they're trying to think about how to implement crisis standards of care, but don't even have access to the basic laboratory tests to calculate uh, any kind of scores with which to think about how to make any assessment about how one is likely to be. And so it was a reminder for me that it's just a huge country. Crisis standards mean different things in different places. And I'm really looking forward to today's speakers to help guide us through how we might be thinking about this. We are thrilled to have Professor Larry Gostin as our moderator. Uh, professor Gostin is a professor at Georgetown University and the director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. He's a member of the advisory group for this webinar series, and he served as chair of a major Institute of Medicine consensus report recommending the original framework for crisis standards of care. Larry, over to you to frame today's conversation and thanks for all of your contributions. Well, thank you, Nikki, and thank you for all of your contributions. And on behalf of uh, the National Academy and uh, the American Public Health Association, I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you uh, to today's webinar and our hats go off to these two leading organizations for kind of helping to guide the country and educate the country uh, at a moment when we're experiencing a once in a century event um, uh, of public, public health crisis that we know um, has no modern um, precedent. Uh, uh, as we speak, um, we understand all of us that um, there has been um, a deep concern in the United States of America about um, scarcity. Um, the scarcity um, affects health system and hospital functioning. Um, 
which in turn um, places patients at risk um, because we don't have enough um, uh, medical resources like um, diagnostic testing um, uh, kits, uh, ventilators, um, and other necessary um, uh, uh, medical equipment um, to keep patients safe. And of course, it's not just COVID patients because all of us um, may have had other health conditions um, and that's being put on hold as well. And so you've got an overload of the health system. Beyond that, um, turns out uh, sadly that uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is highly contagious. Um, and so health workers are at risk and keeping them safe with personal protective equipment um, is critically important, not just to our mission, but to our ethical values um, to, to be faithful to first responders. And as you may have um, seen from uh, uh, the public discussion, um, the World Health Organization has been much in the spotlight um, and uh, has really been um, uh, uh, thought of about how it's handled this pandemic. Um, but we do need the World Health Organization more than we've ever needed it in the past. And we need to come together, not just as a community of Americans, but as a community of the world, um, because this is truly um, going to affect every community, every country um, in the world. And so we need a robust um, World Health Organization to lead us through it. And if we think about what Dr. Laurie talked about in terms of the high variability of capacities here in the United States, think about that high variability globally. Um, there'll be many countries in the world um, that have very weak health systems, um, fragile governments and governance. Um, and uh, as we speak, um, uh, COVID-19 is poised to run through um, some of the uh, lower income countries at most at risk in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent. And we're gonna have to make ch hard choices there too about crisis standards of care. Um, and we need the World Health Organization to help set those standards, set those norms, provide guidance, provide technical assistance, and also to help beef up health systems to deal um, with the kinds of scarcity we see. And so this uh, webinar could not be um, more um, timely. So to, on today's webinar, we're going to examine uh, crisis standards of care within the context of the developing uh, and ongoing COVID-19 crisis. We'll begin with an overview and learn about some of the real-time decision-making that's being made at state health departments and hospital systems. And then we're going to delve into the complicated and very hard ethical questions of how do you enact and implement crisis standards of care um, and um, what we do going forward in the United States and hopefully globally. Um, for this, we've got really an unrivaled um, series of experts um, that are gonna help guide the discussion. Um, John Hick, who served with me on the um, Crisis Standards of Care Committee at, on the, uh, for the in Institute of Medicine, is currently the Deputy Chief Medical Director for em Emergency Medical Services and Director for Emergency Preparedness for Hennepin, Hennepin Healthcare, which serves uh, Minneapolis and the surrounding county. Dr. Hick is one of the nation's leading experts on crisis standards of care, and we all turn to him when we have hard problems. Uh, Rebecca G is the former Secretary of Health um, uh, for uh, the state of Louisiana, currently the head of the Louisiana State University Healthcare Services Division. She's going to share with us her perspectives on the challenges that are faced by state health departments and hospital systems. And as we know, uh, COVID is being fought from city to city, county to county, state to state. And so her perspective is gonna be critically important. And then Jeff Kahn, who has been working um, tirelessly, um, both as a member of the National Academy of Medicine and, and as a public figure, 
um, is the director of the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics and sits on the hospital's uh, decision-making committee with regard to COVID-19 care. He's gonna help walk us through the ethics of enacting crisis standards of care. Um, so I thank um, all of you for joining us today. I thank uh, the National Academy and, um, and the American Public Health Association and particularly our panelists. And so to get us started, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Heck, um, and we'll look forward to your giving us an overview of what crisis standards of care are and how we can implement them. Thanks so much, Larry, and just much appreciation to you and to Nikki. Nikki had charged us at uh, then the Institute of Medicine in 2009 with coming up for a framework for how we might make difficult resource allocation decisions with the H1N1 pandemic. And we fortunately uh, got off a little bit easy in that pandemic, but not so much this time. And so uh, it's a privilege to be working with you again, and, and unfortunate as the situation is, um, I think that we have some good foundations anyway to respond from. So this is going to be a little bit of a book jacket version of crisis standards of care and its impact, uh, you know, and what we can use principally to apply to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But there's a lot of nuance here that I'm, I'm not gonna be able to cover, but that uh, some of you are, are more familiar with than I am, even because of your personal experiences with this disease. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanna draw a little bit of a distinction between crisis standards of care, which is the systems response that includes you know, government support for the care and the changes in care that we need to provide during a disaster, and particularly in a pandemic, a long lasting event like this, where those emergency orders, that official support uh, of the disaster response efforts are so important to promote consistency, to promote fairness, to promote equity across the care system. Crisis care is really situational, and to Nikki's point, it is the inadequate resources that you are faced with in front of you, and you must do the best you can to provide the best care possible in that situation. Uh, regardless of the number of patients you have, um, you will do the best you can, but the systems and the processes need to adapt to that situation, and so there is not a one-size-fits-all here. Next, please. So I think we need to be careful not to think of crisis standards of care as a light switch that we flip on and off. Next. It's much more a set of tools, and whether that is uh, adaptations of personal protective equipment, whether it is adaptations of our respiratory care profiles to encourage high flow nasal cannula oxygen in patients we might normally intubate, uh, whether it gets all the way to the point of having to reallocate ventilators, Crisis Standards of Care really provides a set of tools that can be applied to the clinical situation. And it's our job to make sure that we have processes in place, that we have clinical input into those decisions, and we create processes that will be the most fair, equitable, accountable, and proportional to the needs of the incident. Next slide, please. This was a framework slide that I think a lot of you are probably familiar with, but on the left-hand side is our conventional patient care status. We use our usual spaces, our usual staff, our usual supplies. In the middle is where we really have the opportunity to prevent getting into crisis. And I, I wanna emphasize this because I think in some cases it becomes almost too easy to say, we're going to make triage decisions and, and withhold care from certain individuals or reallocate care. And in reality, we probably haven't done the best that we absolutely can to extend that contingency space to provide the functionally equivalent care that we can in repurposed areas by extending our staff, by conserving supplies, but also by transferring patients from an overwhelmed area to an area that has capacity to moving when needed resources to the patients or patients to the resources and making sure that within a hospital that we're not having pockets of care that are very, very different from an uh, equity and from a consistency standpoint of even patients in that same facility. So making the maximum use of these resources we have, making sure that we've thought through the adaptations before we get into them is important because under stress, our brain really narrows its scope and ability to problem solve. And we tend to just do what's in front of us and keep doing it over and over. And a lot of times that's not a really good strategy, as I often tell my 16-year-old daughter. 
On the right-hand side is when we get into crisis and really moving from a patient focus to a population-focused basis and saying, what can we do that's going to do the greatest good for the greatest number? And in that case, we really are putting the patients at a degree of risk. We may even be putting providers at a degree of risk if what we're talking about from a crisis standpoint is conservation of PPE, for example. But it's a calculated risk, and we need to make sure that we're balancing those risks against the potential benefits. So... With that in mind, I'll talk through just a few of the specific applications of some of this framework to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Part of doing the greatest good is making sure that you have strong incident management and strong surge capacity plans going into an incident and during the incident, and that you're adapting those plans and techniques to the demands of the day and making sure that you're not siloing yourself and thinking just about one department, just about critical care, but thinking about the healthcare system as a whole, thinking about other partners down the street, over a state line, wherever else you need to look, under the couch cushions, you need to find the resources that you can find and apply them in a systematic way. But you need support from your administration, from your incident command system, for doing the things that you may have to do if it comes down to difficult resource choices and allocation decisions. The farther ahead you can anticipate resource shortfalls, the better position you're going to be in to compensate for that when those happen. So think ahead about what might happen and what your contingency plans are now. And then solve the imbalance. As I mentioned, bring the resources in and know where those resources exist and how fast you can get them. Transfer patients to other locations that have capacity. And when you have to, triage resources, but don't triage before you've done those other things. Get help. Uh, don't be an island uh, in these situations. Next slide. So the core strategies you can really use are to conserve, substitute, adapt, reuse, and reallocate. And we've seen examples of each of these in COVID-19, whether it's conserving and putting people on ventilators on a more delayed basis or conserving, in some cases, medications, uh, sedative and otherwise, substituting different technologies when we need to, so meter dose inhalers for nebulizers, for example, adapting, um, you know, putting two patients on one ventilator. If you carefully select them uh, and keep them paralyzed, that may be a very short-term stopgap maneuver that you can do while you look for an alternative anesthesia machine or something else uh, that you might use to bridge those patients. Reuse, uh, whether it's reusing ventilator circuits or other things that we normally don't reuse, uh, but you can with high-level disinfection, is extremely important. And at the end, if we have to, reallocating resources from one patient, one location to another, uh, may be the only option that we have. Next slide, please. Some of the hospital challenges that have been faced with COVID-19 are space and in particular expanding critical care. So looking hard at your post-anesthesia care units, procedure areas, intermediate care units, uh, even ambulatory surgery centers. There's many locations where a fairly high level of monitored care is provided that can easily adapt and provide staff uh, for ongoing critical care. And we need to make sure that we're really emphasizing the maximization of those spaces and utilization of those spaces. Our staff will need to step up and step over. And what I mean by that is it doesn't make any sense to train a dermatologist to operate a ventilator. I mean, I, they're probably brighter than I am, but it's just not a skill set that they have for the most part or are familiar with. So stepping up the intermediate care nurse, stepping up the hospitalist, stepping up uh, care providers that are very close to an intensive care unit uh, care on a daily basis to provide them a little more orientation, a little more familiarity, a little more comfort with that level of care. And then stepping over, taking critical care domains such as anesthesia and some of our other colleagues that aren't used to providing ongoing critical care but are more than familiar with managing a ventilated patient, uh, doing airway procedures, medicating and keeping patients sedated. Those are techniques that they can step over into critical care with very little additional training and provide a significant augmentation of staff. On the stuff or supply side, We've seen pretty consistent shortages with sedative medications, uh, personal protective equipment. Fortunately, uh, nowhere yet has run out of ventilators, knock on wood, um, but airway supplies have been critically short in some institutions. 
So thinking hard again about how we allocate, reuse, uh, where some alternative ventilators might be out in the community and dental practices and other places with anesthesia machines or transport ventilators, other sources of ventilators, even veterinary may be an option. Uh, but we are seeing more and more ventilators coming into the system now, and that is a good thing. But that doesn't mean by putting somebody on a ventilator you provide effective critical care. So there's other things like the monitors, uh, IV pump tubing, uh, or making use of IV drips, uh, where we actually get back to counting drops again, um, and other ways of measuring and giving IV medications. On the special consideration side, knowing where we can cohort patients and how to preserve some of our specialty services like trauma care and other things is important, and making sure that we're able to take appropriate isolation practices with our staff is critical. Next slide, please. In general, our focus, if we take the left side as a daily basis, and this is from the ACCP 2014 document on uh, critical care expansion and, and the Task Force for Mass Critical Care, which has some really good articles, I think, on expansion of critical care. But this is the general framework, is that as we expand critical care in the hospital during COVID-19 or other similar situations, we're forcing patients who need lower acuity care uh, out into the community, out into alternate care sites and other locations, and we need to be prepared for that potential flow. Um, these patients are very ill. Uh, they remain quite unstable at times for you know days and even weeks afterwards, um, and it's a difficult transition, but we may need some alternate care sites. Those need to be carefully thought out. Next slide, please. The usual framework for an alternate care site is a situation like this, where we have you know, three-inch cot mattresses and um, maybe some, if you're lucky, some draping in a flat space area, such as a gymnasium. And these work well for certain applications, but for the type of older, weak, convalescent care individuals, this is probably not a good environment for them to be cared for. We're going to need good mattresses and locations that are close to bathrooms. And so things like uh, long-term care facilities that have been recently decommissioned and hotels and other places that, that place the patients in a care environment where they can be better isolated from each other, uh, receive better care, better comfort, and better support in their convalescence are probably better choices uh, than some of these open, flat-spaced areas. The other thing that should be emphasized is that there is tremendous potential for alternate care locations, for crisis care locations on hospital campuses and in owned facilities that are already operating as healthcare facilities. Whenever possible, we should try to keep hospital patients in hospitals and within healthcare infrastructure, particularly with the potential for decompensation, like we've seen with a number of COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. So when we have to make difficult triage decisions, there's basically the three C's. There needs to be the concept of operations, how decisions are made at the institution. There need to be criteria for making those decisions. And there needs to be coordination in that process and amongst those criteria within that regional area. So there's consistency and the patients aren't getting a different standard of care at one location than another. Next slide, please. So an example of a crisis standards of care concept of operations might be your triggers, um, and this is just a diagram from a Minnesota document that's available on the web. The triggers and the notifications for uh, CSC activities, how it's integrated with incident command, who participates in a triage team, and what is the process for making those decisions? Because ideally, you wouldn't like the bedside provider to be making those decisions how those are communicated, and what sort of appeals process or quality assurance is in place. And we have to remember, too, that those processes need to adapt to the circumstances at hand, that if you literally have a half a dozen people at any given moment in the emergency department presenting the need intubation, it won't be possible to go through some of these frameworks in the most ideal way. And we will have to adapt then to the circumstances at hand, just as we always do with crisis standards of care. But we need to set out the ideal first and work backwards from there. Next slide, please. As far as criteria, 
criteria goes, we need to remember that whatever criteria are out there, and the SOFA score gets used a lot, and I'm one of the primary you know, sort of perpetrators of that, if you will, after publishing one of the initial articles, but let's remember that SOFA is a really lousy predictor for outcomes um, in these cases. In cases of respiratory failure, um, SOFA does not have very good predictive value, and so it may be very attractive to compare patients in the general scheme of things, but I would really caution strongly against using SOFA um, as a decision tool unless it's coupled with COVID-related uh, you know, mortality predictors. I would also be very careful, this is from Minnesota Department of Health card set, I would make sure that whatever state criteria you're doing, you go through that and make sure there are not exclusion criteria, particularly those that are based on uh, anything to do with um, functional scores or anything to do with pre-existing disabilities. Uh, there's already a couple states that are, are in court uh, because of some of the existing language, um, and some of that language was included in some of the initial recommendations that uh, different specialty societies had made, but we've really appreciated over the years that we need to be very careful about sort of pre-existing conclusions and exclusion criteria. We need to consider everyone that's coming in the door, and we need to consider them in the context of whatever process they have, whether it's the subdural bleed or COVID-19. We need to take the prognostic features that we know are appropriate for that condition and apply that to what we think their prognosis is. Next slide, please. So when we talk a little bit more about criteria, I just want to emphasize again the importance of including COVID-19 specific prognostic factors. And I will disagree with Doug White. I don't think that everyone agrees that um, the, the spectrum of age or that we should give uh, resources to the younger population is generally accepted across cultures. Um, I think we have to be very careful about age discrimination when we talk about triage decisions. And yet in this case, advanced age, no question, confers additional mortality with COVID-19. So in, in consideration of that, uh, consideration of increased mortality in the setting of cardiac injury, of very high D-dimers, of the severity of comorbid conditions, new renal failure. Uh, there's, a, there's many prognostic factors that as we get more evidence, we'll be able to hone these even more carefully to be able to predict outcome with COVID-19. And these need to be living documents. We need to update them as better evidence becomes available so we can put the best predictive tools into the hands of clinicians that are trying to work to save these lives. So in order to keep up with that, it's strongly recommended to have a clinical care committee or a similar body that's keeping an eye on that literature and keeping an eye on updated specialty society recommendations, such as those from the American College of Chest Physicians available on the ChestNet website. And these need to be specific enough so we avoid ad hoc decision making at the bedside. Uh, we really want to give the clinicians constructs on which to make decisions and ideally have someone above them uh, make those decisions so they can concentrate on the care of the patient um, and ideally you know, make that in partnership with a couple people so there's not one individual on whose shoulders that moral injury will come to rest. Next slide, please. Coordination is the final three-third three of three legs of this stool. We really need to make sure there's consistency. So regional coordination with healthcare coalitions is so important, and communication about what level of care is being provided and a cooperative mechanism to facilitate transfers, intensive care unit transfers into a major metro area from an outstate area or within a metro area to assure that we have consistency and again equity uh, of the care provided is very important. And also coordination within states and even interstate for the guidelines that we're using, uh, the criteria for decision making, uh, advisory committees, and then brokering of transfers uh, across regional lines. I think this is so important to make sure that we're providing uh, as consistent um, and as fair care as we can provide given our system and given its limitations. And a lot of times we don't think about the smaller hospitals, you know, in non-metro areas and what they can contribute potentially towards these responses and how best to utilize them uh, in the process. So coordination ahead of time can pay off big uh, when COVID-19 really hits your area. Next slide, please. I just want to put in a plug for Asper Tracy, which I'm, I'm blessed to be the uh, editor for. Um, Asper Tracy does have some great topic collections. Uh, we have some shrunk down topic collections specifically for COVID-19, and we also have some broader ones for crisis standards of care, 
uh, for a broad range of topics uh, that are directly applicable to some of the critical care surge capacity and other planning that you're doing. So please take advantage of those resources. And uh, Larry, again, uh, thanks to you and thanks to Nikki, not only for having me on today, but for your leadership uh, in this topic area across the years. Well, thank you, John. Uh, that was a, a truly splendid um, overview of the topic, uh, really laid the framework. And what I particularly uh, liked was your emphasis on equity and planning and also non-discrimination, not, uh, not using a person's status as a determining factor, whether it's um, age, race, disability, um, gender or other kinds of um, uh, status of, uh, of the individual. I think those are critically important, uh, both legally and ethically, and I know we're going to return to that with Rebecca and Jeff. Um, so with that, thank you. Um, we uh, take our hat off to you, John, for all you do for the country um, and for patients around the country. Um, and now it's a, it's a great pleasure to um, uh, ask you, uh, Rebecca, invite you to um, give your perspective from state health departments and hospital systems. Over to you, Rebecca. All right, thanks. Thank you, Larry. And thanks to Victor and to Nikki, who I've had the great pleasure of being uh, a warrior with when we had the Baton Rouge area floods in 2016 and 100,000 structures were underwater, including part of our governor's mansion. I'm really grateful to her and to the Academy for leading these discussions. Um, you know, from Katrina to COVID, Louisiana has not been a stranger to tragedy. Um, next slide. And the first two weeks of this epidemic, likely in part due to the Mardi Gras celebrations that had some of the largest numbers of people uh, in close proximity during the time this virus was circulating and before that was widely known. And we had the largest percentage increase in the world, including at that time compared to New York City. Um, currently, Louisiana has 21,000 cases and we've lost over 1,100 of our citizens. We do, however, hope that the dark days are behind us. Uh, two weeks ago was when our ICUs had patients spilling over and one of the hospitals that our colleagues work in at LSU was within two vents of running out. Um, today, we have 150 fewer patients on vents than one week ago. Um, next slide. Um, and you can see here the case numbers and death counts are going down. Um, next slide. I mean, the death counts are going up, but case numbers going down. And here you can see that we have fewer patients on vents and you know, the hospital beds are going down. So we're hoping that we're starting to see uh, some improvement here because of efforts to social distance and so on. Um, next slide, please. But, you know, the, the journey was not easy and a lot of what John said, I'm going to reiterate and I really appreciate his leadership, but our journey was shocking. And for me, you know, having been a health secretary and led responses to weather events, this has been unprecedented in that this was the first time that in, in my career where we've had as a nation uh, and many of us to address something together and simply were not prepared. Um, in, in particular, the, the journey to get uh, protective equipment for our staff or PPE was shocking and then it laid bare the lack of federal and state preparedness and coordination for this scale of an epidemic. In fact, there was great confusion about the federal assets available, PPE supply and when that supply would come and the federal stockpiles were not adequate. And as a result, at LSU and at, at the command center at GOSEP, um, we were extremely confused. And what we did get was inadequate. At one point, we got N95s, a large supply from the Strategic National Stockpile, but they were well past their recommended shelf life. We called other academic medical centers in states where there were few cases and plenty of resources, but fear combined with a scarcity mentality meant that I was told that no PPE could be shared or sent from other institutions. Um, so therefore we look locally. We unloaded PPE from dentist office and vet veterinary clinics. Um, we vetted um, our health systems in Louisiana, sources from China, people that had been selling tchotchkes weeks before now sourcing PPE. Um, and as demand increased, the prices did as well, and the quality of products was unclear. 
And so given that there was no clear path to having appropriate supply and given our numbers really indicating at that time that we were going to run out of ventilators and run out of PPE, we did extraordinary measures such as resorting to 3D printers and even commandeering a furniture store in New Orleans to print um, shields and to start making face masks and gowns. Um, ventilators, of course, were another challenge and lack of clar clarity about when they would come, what kind of ventilators would come, and who they would be sent to added to confusion. And health systems um, and states were bidding against each other and then sometimes against FEMA. In incredibly frustrating. You'd find ventilators and they'd be swiped by FEMA. You really have no surety of what would come and when. And it really felt to our faculty on the front lines that it was like we were in an auction for our lives and the lives of our patients. And sadly, this waste and redundancy really even more so than places like LSU and Oxnard disproportionately impacted our rural hospitals and federally qualified health centers that simply weren't going to win this eBay bidding game uh, or the power struggles about where resources would go. Um, and uh, the 25 bed hospital we run, uh, Lolly Kemp, even today was out of gowns and we had to order some and, and get them there today. There were well-meaning private solutions developed such as Project 95 um, N95.org for PPE and vents, but during our surge, there was no way to prioritize based on need. It was first come, first serve, and FEMA could take whatever they wanted before states could get it. Um, really, solutions are needed, um, both public and private sectors, uh, solutions that use algorithms for prioritization during times of disaster and scarcity. Um, there are several examples of ones that have been developed Notably, the University of Washington has some algorithms that have been helpful for planning. Johns Hopkins University and the Louisiana Department of Health have partnered. Um, however, they are still inadequate. Um, they need to be invested in and matured and the ability to do predictive modeling bolstered because we overestimated um, the need and underestimated results of, of measures for distancing. And so, um, you know, clearly we're, we're not uh, correct at, at what our what our numbers what the numbers we thought would be um, you know some good news has come last night at the White House the dynamic ventilator reserve was announced that's really a no-brainer but a good thing that it's happening um, Adam Bowler and auctioner together announced it and this idea is that places like auctioner right now that actually have excess ventilator use could deploy to somewhere like New York or Minnesota or wherever these ventilators are needed so that we don't oversupply and, um, and take too much for ourselves when they're not needed. I mean, a similar reserve could be set up for PPE. And we need leadership from professional associations, both from facilities, places that represent hospitals like the American Hospital Association and professional societies like my society, ACOG, um, to give us guidance on what should be done, as John mentioned. Um, so, for example, one hospital in New Orleans asked employees to put their N95 mask in a paper bag and reuse them and spray hydrogen peroxide on it. Um, other hospitals were able to give employees new masks daily and that inconsistency led to panic and concern. And it certainly would have been helpful to have AHA guidance or CDC uh, protocols that are published for mask reuse, as well as to provide selective guidance that's triggered by scarcity dynamics so that you don't have these um, you know, these practices that are either unproven, unwarranted, or inconsistent um, in regions because you can't allocate PE, PPE effectively or because of concern over scarcity or because of lack of preparation. Also, we need recommendations on how to best sterilize scarce PPE. People are talking, you know, we've, we've used ozone in one setting, we're using um, UV radiation. What is the right way to do it? How do you scale this? And, and what is the evidence? That's something we had to wade through and still have confusion over. Um, and over the past few weeks as well, we've used our pluripotential smart people at LSU to, to redeploy, as John mentioned, to other fields. Um, one of my favorite social media posts said, stay at home because you don't want to be intubated by a gynecologist. Um, you know, we have used people like surgeons and, anesthesi and anesthesiologists in critical care settings to do lines. We have uptrained nurse practitioners and individuals who do primary care to, to work in intensive care units, but we could have done a lot better job. We, if the professional societies could help guide us as to how do you move up the ladder and help train people up, this should be done uh, prior to a disaster. It should be done with um, 
with training and it should be done before those, it, those essential workers on the front lines get exhausted or, or overwhelmed um, and are really inability and unable to function optimally. Um, finally, there's been a lot of confusion around workplace safety procedures in the wake of this pandemic. Um, I think that work, essential worker um, protection is a health equity issue. We're treating essential workers as, they're, as if they're disposable. We've had three bus drivers die just in New Orleans because they had no protection and were getting breathed on all day by all kinds of people. Um, essential workers need, um, there need to be national guidelines. Um, there should be a coordinated effort by entities such as OSHA and NIOSH to address these important questions as they relate to pandemics so that folks who are particularly low income and, and unempowered have somewhere to turn for protection. Um, next slide. Oh, so there are a couple more slides, so I'll just keep going. Um, so what actual decisions are state health departments having to make and what information or guidance can help them better make these decisions? So at LSU, our doctors would have liked to know what, P what type of PPE, here we go, what type of PPE are needed and for what type of procedures and when is protection needed? How is protection best utilized, sterilized and disposed of? How best to prioritize and schedule patients? For example, should we mirror what some grocery stores are doing and set special morning hours for the most vulnerable patients after the night team has come in and cleaned? Um, which patients are a priority, these ethical issues? Um, for urgent but non-emergent procedures, for example, should a 31-year-old mother of three with breast cancer uh, have priority versus a 75-year-old with bladder cancer and severe dementia and other chronic diseases? So who gets priority? And also who gets priority for testing? You know, as we move into next stages of this, who gets the antibody test? Who gets the COVID test? And right now in New Orleans, if you don't have transportation and you haven't been able to get to a walk-in clinic, you don't have a test. Um, so we need to address those, uh, those issues through mobile uh, testing, uh, which is what LSU aims to do by next week. Um, we need health disparities data and ongoing measurements so that if implicit bias is getting in the way of providers' decision-making about these critical resources, that we can address it. We know right now that African Americans are dying of disproportional rates. 60% um, of the deaths in Louisiana are African Americans versus the 32% that African Americans make up of our population. Why is that? We need to be able to address some of these things in more real time. And finally, better evidentiary support for severe um, scarcity scenarios. For example, event sharing guidelines, um, and then support for situations where end of life care must be provided without family members. And finally, crisis counseling services should be available for caregivers who are dealing with unprecedented numbers of dead. Um, and then next slide. Um, and then in the face of rapidly changing protocols uh, for clinical care, what can be done um, for, the, for the care of COVID-19? So early on in the epidemic, um, there was very slow diffusion of information, um, both to providers and the public. And so we, um, and sorry, this slide isn't available to you, but um, we, uh, there was not a good COVID screener. The COVID screener that came out from the CDC was not uh, particularly friendly in terms of being literacy and numeracy uh, uh, um, adequate. It, it asked questions that most people, many people don't know the answers to. And in fact, some of the questions were, are you about to just stop breathing? You know, it, which you sh hopefully should not be filling an online questionnaire out if, if you're if you're going to answer that question yes. So you know, really slow response, difficult for state health departments to to communicate with the public about where they should go, when they should go to emergency rooms, um, and very also difficult for frontline providers to cull through journal articles and do lit reviews and figure out what knowledge um, is happening. And then just to underscore, it's extremely difficult when politicians make statements about certain drugs and. Um, and that they should be used for COVID. We had runs on several of these drugs in Louisiana. And in fact, our Board of Pharmacy had to make a statement um, about um, not being able to fill these things. So it might be anticipated that we need to have guidelines about what pharmacies are able to fill and for, for whom during these types of events. Um, social media has been very effective for our clinicians to help them vet and curate information. And it's often reassuring for them to know that others are also going through similar uh, situations. So it would be helpful to for the AHA to support hospital level decisions such as scarcity um, and reuse models as mentioned before 
um, specialty societies to support spread of information and rapidly disseminate promising clinical protocols and the National Academy of Medicine or another scientific body could vet and curate this um, so that there could be public trust in this information. Um, and, these, and these types of vetted curated um, messages could help bolster local networks such as COVID NOLA here in New Orleans that help the public understand why we have um, stay at home orders for as long as they are and, and help them understand admonitions. Um, and for COVID, you know, there's an urgency of timelines, obviously, and need to bolster the COVID clinical trials network uh, or could bolster and create a COVID clinical cl trials network similar to what's being done for cancer. And private solutions such as the website World Without COVID was launched yesterday morning with the goal of connecting patients to coronavirus clinical trials. More of that is needed. And finally, if a single medication back to medication scarcity is found to be effective and there are shortages, we should consider 1498 authority for the US to manufacture these pharmaceuticals or a national subscription model similar to what Louisiana has implemented to, uh, to try to eradicate hepatitis B in our state. And in conclusion, we've been reminded by this epidemic that the health of one individual can have profound impacts on the health of the community. And my hope is that our experience with COVID will bolster a national dedication to universal coverage and certainly uh, reinvestments in public health because what we didn't pay for, we are certainly paying for now. Um, the crisis standards of care that John and Nikki and others at the National Academy of Medicine advanced and first promoted in 2009 are a good start, but there's a lot more work to do. So thank you and sorry about the slide. Gaffaw. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, that you gave us a a wonderful view from what it's down in like in the health and hospital system, um, and that's you know crucial. And I particularly liked uh, the idea that you put forward that that Nikki had also mentioned, um, which is you know equity and 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 why we're having these kind of different seeing these kinds of uh, differential impacts on certain communities like African-American uh, communities or, um, or, or American Indian um, communities. Um, and, and, and not only do we need to understand it, but we can understand it unless we have more granular data um, that uh, separates out diagnosis, illness, hospitalization, and death um, uh, on, um, uh, with more uh, specificity. Um, I also, of course, appreciated very much your attention to um, uh, frontline workers, um, you know, people who are putting themselves at risk every day and our uh, core ethical duty um, to keep them safe um, because they're out there working for us every day. We need to be out there working for them every day because um, it, ethical duties are reciprocal. Uh, and so, um, as we are transitioning to um, ethics and the ethics of uh, crisis standards of care and scarcity, um, I'm really delighted to uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Jeff Kahn. Uh, Jeff and I go way back um, uh, in, in uh, thinking about uh, the hard ethical problems that occur um, in relation not only to medical and healthcare, but also to public health and population-based um, uh, uh, evaluations of uh, what works, what doesn't work, what's fair, what's not fair. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to turn it over to you now. Thanks, Larry. And let me say um, thank you to the APHA and the NAM for hosting this really critical conversation. I should say, great to see you and great to see Nikki and John too. And it's making me realize all roads uh, lead through Minneapolis. So good to see everybody, old, old friends um, and, and new acquaintances alike. So um, I'm gonna talk without slides, not because I don't, I don't like slides, but because I'm going to share some of the work that we're engaged in uh, at Johns Hopkins in the, in the midst of planning for the outbreak and uh, for those of you who live in, in Maryland or are paying attention to what's happening, we have not yet had uh, an executive order come from our governor. So I'm, I'm hesitant to get ahead of the release of what will be the state level guidance. So I'm gonna uh, speak from notes rather than show slides. Um, I will say 
too that the um, comments that I'm making relate to the work that we're engaged in as a, a scarce resource planning committee. It isn't specific to um, crisis standards of care, but of course we're in a, a crisis and trying to establish standards of care for this particular crisis. So let me, let me take the questions that were um, posed to us on the panel um, in turn, which will be the way I'll organize my, my comments. The first was um, what ethical considerations must be taken into account when planning to enact crisis standards of care? Uh, of course, in a, a crucial question, and um, both John and Rebecca have um, signaled to them and, and Larry in his comments as well. And, and John, I think, said uh, best care possible. And of course, that's a, a critical commitment that's not just a, a medical and professional commitment, but an, an ethics um, commitment. And so to sort of frame the conversation that we're engaged in, and I, and I know uh, lots of other people around the, the country and around the world are engaged in, we need to think about uh, the ethics commitments and, and principles that are uh, at issue and need to be attended to as we craft frameworks and, and plans for implementing them. So I would list in, in, that, um, in that collection the duty to provide care. So that's about best care possible. And of course, that's a professional commitment of our um, healthcare providers and our healthcare institutions. At the same time, and this is where the tension comes in, we have a duty to steward resources. And in the context of crisis care planning, and in particular, as we're talking about um, the COVID-19 outbreak, we are um, facing potential shortage of life-saving resources. So duty to provide care and duty to steward resources uh, are coming into conflict, at least in theory, if not in practice. And of course, we hope they never will come into conflict in practice, but we're preparing just the same. As we think those through, and that tension, of course, is at the, at the crux, we have to, to think about how to allocate in ways that respect distributive and procedural justice in ways that are equitable. So this, this goes to Larry's points about equity and uh, consideration of, of people where their needs are rather than um, what they look like or where they come from. So equitable approaches to um, distributing scarce resources in ways that are standardized and clear so they can be followed by the providers, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, and, and done so transparently. So I think that's a really critical point, the transparency as a sort of ethics commitment um, so that not only the providers understand, but the, the publics who will be affected um, understand the way that these decisions will be made. And in particular, um, attending to vulnerable parts of our communities and, and people's who have been historically marginalized and therefore may be distrustful of the health system. So we, we I think, have real con concerns to face about um, saying, well, we're not going to treat certain people in certain ways in the context of people mistrusting health systems and not feeling like they would be fully treated under the best of circumstances. So we need to be really careful it, as we uh, face down these difficult um, conversations related to crisis standards of care. So those are the high level principles with the primary goal, which I don't know I need to articulate, but I'll, I'll do it anyway, of, of maximizing the benefit of treatment and enhancing survival for as many patients as possible. That's what we wanna do. And of course, then it's sort of all well, the devil's in the details. So let me um, move to the second question, which was what sort of ethics framework or decision-making assistance to government leaders, hospital and health system administrators, clinicians, et cetera, need to plan and prepare to enact for crisis standards of care. And so I, I will say that the committee that I'm part of, and as I mentioned, we're not calling it a crisis standard of care committee, we're calling it an allocation of scarce resources committee, but it's performing that function in the context of the COVID outbreak. We have been a meeting this is the fifth week we've been on remote work and we started the Monday of our first week. So um, now into the fifth week, we're meeting every single day, uh, twice a day for an hour each time, uh, seven days a week. And that's a group of 20 uh, people from across the Johns Hopkins health system who are, are working hard to craft 
not just sort of high level um, guidance, which is sort of the, the um, kind of principles that I mentioned a few moments ago, but really clear frameworks and guidance documents and implementation plans, not just in general for what we face when there's a shortage, but with specific flow diagrams, um, triggers for when we would invoke um, making triage decisions, the steps that would be involved, the individuals who would be involved in making triage decisions, the roles that those people would play, the timeframes for those decisions, so how quickly they would uh, need to be made, and each for specific resources that may be um, scarce. And so uh, I'm sure it doesn't um, bear repeating, but let me just make the list here or, or offer the list of the things that we have been working through, and I'm sure others around the country and around the world thinking about the same things. Lots of attention has been paid to ICU beds and ventilators. Uh, and of course, we all hope that we won't face the situation where we have to make decisions about which patient gets the, the ventilator if we're down to more than one patient and fewer ventilators than patients available. But it also turns out that there are other um, resources that are uh, potential to be potential to be scarce or likely to be scarce. And among the things that have received less attention, and I think worth, worth saying, is, is blood. The blood supply is under a, a threat, not because of people needing to be transfused when they're infected by COVID-19, but because people are staying home and not donating blood. And, and blood is, of course, a perishable commodity that relies on altruistic donors. And people who need transfusion um, will need transfusion before uh, and after and during the, the current pandemic. And so the blood supply is in peril and we need to have a plan for how to allocate it. A little bit of a quick sideline, which makes it for an interesting ethics um, discussion, is that unlike uh, ICU beds, which are one patient, one bed, or ventilators, you know, one, one ventilator, one patient, unless they're multiplexed, blood is a variably used commodity. Some people need only one or two units, and, and other cases require literally hundreds of units of blood. And it's possible for the, these massive transfusion protocol cases to sometimes wipe out a, uh, the supply of a blood bank in a single case, especially if the blood supply is already suppressed. And so we have a, a difficult ethics question to answer about at what point do you trigger restrictions on the use of blood if doing so would eradicate the blood supply so that there was none left for other patients? It's, do we use it all on one or two patients or do we spread it out and use it maybe on 100 or 200 patients. And that's a different ethics calculation than is um, ventilators and ICU beds. So very specific frameworks in terms of how those particular decisions would be made for the very particular resources that would be involved. We've included, and I, I'm sure this is true other places too, transfer policies. How do we decide when it's appropriate to um, have patients come to Johns Hopkins and in what order when we have a shortage and what order of priority would we um, offer access to um, hospital or ICU beds in our hospital. And most recently, we've been trying to work through issues related to allocation of convalescent plasma in the research context, but nonetheless, there are likely to be more patients eligible for uh, receiving convalescent plasma than there are units of plasma to go around. So, very specific guidance is the answer to my question about what sort of ethics framework or decision-making assistance. The more specific, the better, because these are decisions not being made in a hypothetical, but in actual. Um, among the things I wanna say before I, I leave that is, it's really important and it's an ethics point I should have made earlier, that we need to protect clinicians um, from having to make decisions about what's what's good for their patients versus what's available to offer to patients. And so that means creating triage teams with a very specific membership to make decisions and take them out of the hands of the bedside care providers. That's a really important point as part of the, the planning. And uh, among the things that relate to protecting clinicians is making sure that they're protected from liability. And maybe we can talk about that during the Q&A. It's not uh, an ethics issue per se, it's more of a legal issue, but obviously we don't want to put clinicians in, in the position of making decisions um, that will leave them in legal liability for not providing um, adequate standard of care. 
The third question was who should be involved in this planning and decision making. And I made a brief reference to the fact that we've had a, a group of, of 20 um, that involve clinicians of all the relevant um, subspecialties of medicine. Uh, it is in our case chaired by the VP for quality and patient safety. It includes three members who um, have ethics expertise. Uh, so I am on the committee uh, and then my two colleagues who chair the ethics committee at Johns Hopkins Hospital. So we have ethics, we have nursing, we have um, clinic, uh, medical um, care of various types, and we have the general counsel for our um, hospital health system. So very interdisciplinary is the answer to the question about who should be involved. Um, and as I said, we've been meeting very, very frequently. And I think that part of the answer is you need to talk about these things, not only in prospect, but as you are living through them because conditions change as we heard from both John and Rebecca. How should the resulting standards that are crafted be communicated to hospital staff, healthcare workers, patients and families and the public? Um, I will say um, nature and humans abhor, abhor vacuums and it's really critical to share the information as soon as you possibly can because people will otherwise um, try to figure it out for themselves and that tends to be inaccurate. And so uh, we are trying to be proactive in doing things like hosting town halls um, FAQs are being created, talking points for people when they're called by um, members of the media to um, talk about what the planning looks like and, and trying to be clear about what will and will not happen. So just by way of example, there was a kind of rumor moving around through some of our communities that if you came into the hospital and were COVID positive, you would automatically be declared a do not resuscitate patient, which is not, not the case. And we've had to um, work hard to get ahead of that so that those sorts of rumors don't take hold among um, the, the public. Um, lastly, the, the last question, and, and then I'll, um, I'll stop and turn it back over to Larry. In the face of rapidly change, changing protocols for clinical care of those with COVID-19, how should or can committees adapt to ensure their decisions are always being informed by the most up-to-date and appropriate ethical guidance? So um, when, we, when we started the process that I have briefly um, described now almost uh, five weeks ago, I think we all thought, and I think we were actually told we would be at this for just a few weeks, two or three weeks, and we would craft the, the framework and implementation plans, which would then be shared with our colleague hospitals around the state and, and eventually become part of the, the state level approach. And so we would do that work, work very hard at it very fast, and then turn it over to those who would implement it. That has not proven to be the case. And that's because as we have been working, things have continued to change. And so I, my answer is you need to keep at it with a group of people who are committed to helping think through the issues as they arise in an ongoing way. Um, remarkably, lots of busy people, 20 very busy people show up every day at one o'clock and seven o'clock p.m. for an hour and we work through whatever the issue of the day is. Um, I don't think anybody's missed a single meeting. Um, we have come to think of each other as sort of family. We're living through a little bit of what feels like wartime and we're not even the ones who are um, at the bedside trying to make these hard decisions. So I think this is something that people need to be prepared for. It's a, a, it's a commitment, but we're all, I think, feeling like we need to step up and um, see this through to the end. So that's, that's all I, I think I wanted to include in my notes. Uh, I guess the last thing I will say is it's critical um, to share and coordinate among all of the affected parties. In our case, it's the hospitals across our state, but um, like I'm sure all of those of you um, watching and listening, um, the email listservs that, that I'm part of just sort of exploded when we ended up starting to talk about um, scarce resource planning and, and the level of willingness to share what people were working through in draft form and just sharing ideas and helping to figure out what best practice was has been uh, remarkable and, and people have been really willing um, to, to do that in ways that I think will lead everybody to make better um, and, and more thoughtful decisions. And so I think coordinating and sharing is a really important takeaway from what we have um, experienced so far. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that was a real tour de force. And I think you've told us that, you know, we need a, a good multidisciplinary transparent process. 
um, that once you come up with those ethical standards, you need to have good health communication so that uh, people understand and are educated. Um, and then you talked uh, about um, medical li uh, malpractice liability. Of course, I'm a law professor, and I think that um, if, if a health worker is following um, good ethical standards, um, he or she should be protected against um, liability. And so ethics and law go hand in hand. So we've got about um, 20 to 25 minutes for questions and answers. I've got a lot. I'm going to send them, I'm going to um, read them, but I would like, if we can, to have uh, you answer them as quickly as possible so we can get through as many as we can. And I've got them by text message. So this first one is for John or Jeff. Um, can you uh, talk about the concepts of health literacy and patient-centered care in the context of COVID-19? How do we make sure patients understand their choices? How can we make sure patients have people to speak for them and support them when families can't be in the room, as we know is all too common uh, during COVID-19? Um, so uh, who wants to take this, uh, John or Jeff? Like John is muted. Maybe I'll start while John unmutes. I, okay. I well, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that just one of you will do each, oh, okay. so that we can get. Well, I'll tell you what we're doing really, really fast. So yeah, there's been a, a really important point, and so we've crafted materials for patients and and families that are going to be shared with them, that are um, uh, you know reading level appropriate, as well as scripts for clinicians to use um, to make make the points that need to be made to families and patients. So we're highly attuned to exactly these concerns and there need to be materials crafted um, and early on before you need to use them, obviously. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got another question. Um, uh, this one is for John or Rebecca. Um, uh, and uh, if we're expecting a second surge after social distancing is lifted and many public health experts think that that's likely, other things we can be doing now to prepare in terms of training, equipment, guidelines. Is there bandwidth or attention uh, to start term preparedness right now, um, figuring that you know, we're going to be in incremental stages with waves of COVID um, that are impacting the health system? Um, so um, John, are you still muted or, or are you able to uh, jump in here? If not, Rebecca, would you mind? So, yeah, so, so John mentioned some of these and I would echo what he said. I also, these, you know, the types of research protocols, registries, health disparities data, we can start bolstering those information systems, um, national guidelines, professional guidelines, workplace safety standards. These are all things that could be done, you know, working on, we could be working on now. Um, algorithms for decision making and, and information for the public that is uh, appropriate for literacy, really focused on um, communities of color and other communities, um, Native Americans, Spanish speaking folks, Vietnamese community here in New Orleans, that we need, we need materials for them, we could be working on that. Um, and uh, definitely telemedicine resources and support. And then certainly the professional societies creating um, you know, better protocols for PPE use. Um, the sterilization protocols uh, have been used throughout many hospital systems. And it, by this point, we ought to know what works best. We need to disseminate that uh, quickly. And uh, professional organizations um, should be helping to guide um, hospitals, uh, hospital administrators and systems on what types of persons are best deployed to what types of situations and start giving guidance. And you could start doing drills and training. If you know New Orleans in a week or two, if things are better, we should be training and drilling for the, for the next one. Yes, Larry, I'll just make a quick, quick mention yes, here. I think it's do. so important. Yes. You know, we haven't gone through our first major peak here, but I think it's so important to learn from the healthcare workers who have been through that. What do you need? Because the the mental toll, the physical toll, but also the opportunity to improve practices in that next wave. I think learning from the frontline providers is something that we have to do, uh, and also have you know have to help support them because uh, this is one of the most mentally you know taxing things I think uh, that that any of these providers are ever going to face in their careers. 
It is, you know, and I'll, I would um, just add one other thing, um, which is that, um, you know, by the second wave, I hope that we're going to know more about risk. In other words, what are the procedures and what are the um, infection control measures that we can do that actually, the procedures that raise risk, the infection control standards that can reduce risk. And also I think by that time we should have antibody tests. We should have a better idea um, who might be more um, immunologically protected um, from SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, so we're gonna need to be able to apply science um, uh, in a more sophisticated way in service of um, uh, not only uh, treating patients, but protecting um, health workers. Um, so, you know, this next question is, was addressed to um, John or Jeff, but I think Rebecca could easily do it as well. I mean, we, one of the things, you know, we've all noticed is, is that, you know, probably the highest risk settings in addition to, to hospitals would be um, congregate settings, um, places like nursing homes, prisons, jails, homeless shelters. Um, and so the question is how can we apply um, uh, crisis standards of care um, in, uh, in these settings where um, you've got both highly vulnerable patients and also uh, high, high at risk settings for contagion. Who would like to jump in there? I think I'll defer to Susan as a state, you know, a state health director uh, to start anyway. Okay. So I'll just start. I mean, look, I think it's it's very challenging. We uh, are we've had several clusters of nursing home cases. Our, our veterans home, we've lost twenty five people um, in one veterans home. Just tremendous compression. And the governor issued a, a proclamation that that about who could go back to nursing homes because it's very challenging. We've set up a two thousand bed. Um, location at our convention center to, so that we can offload patients who are COVID positive, who are recovering and convalescent, but don't really need critical care. It's difficult to use something like that in New Orleans for a patient who's in Minden or Bunky. So I, it's, a, it's a big challenge and certainly, um, uh, as you've seen in these reports, the other question is public reporting. There's a lot of, of a controversy right now on do we report these hotspots? How do you report these hotspots? And, and lots of politics and politicking on that. So, um, you know, these are very difficult problems. Okay, thank I think you. Just to emphasize, Larry, yeah. these are such vulnerable populations and, and we just owe a lot of proactive defensive efforts uh, to each of these facilities and really thinking through what that means and, and trying to get ahead of some of those outbreaks and then, you know, isolate and quarantine and do the best we can to protect those. But I think too, with long-term care, I think it's so important that we're thinking through end-of-life wishes in the context of some of the level of critical care that's required to get people through these illnesses and just making sure that we're being consistent with people's wishes. Um, it's so important to have that outlined ahead of time to reduce the moral stress for families as well as for caregivers. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and we have to also remember that in this environment, there, um, these are not just vulnerable, but they're, they're isolated and they're, they're, they're removed from their family and their loved ones that can provide the kind of support um, that they need. Um, the next question is um, actually near and dear to my heart because we spent most of our time talking about the um, a hospital system and the healthcare system. But remember, um, we have a health system which includes a public health uh, and workforce and community health workforce. Um, so how in these more population-based workforce environments, with public health or community health workers, um, how does a, a crisis standards of care apply and how can we best equip and inform the public health workforce? And I think that could, you know, it was addressed to John, but frankly, all three of you know this stuff really well. So any of you please jump in. Yeah, again, I think I'll defer that one uh, back to Susan. Uh, as you know, being in charge of state public health, I think you're probably in a better position to start with that than I am. 
So it's Rebecca. So I think that um, number one, what Rebecca. how do we use community health workers and public health professionals? Um, one thing we're looking at is similar to what New York City has done is to use a platform like Unite Us. We have to recognize that although people are dying of COVID, and, and of course, I, you, you missed my last three slides. One of them was of Ellis Marcellus, who's a, a jazz great, a phenomenal teacher, father uh, to some incredible jazz musicians who's died. And so we can't lose sight of that. Um, but there are also people who are going to die of hunger, of neglect, of abuse, of violence. Um, the, the social needs that we are encountering in Louisiana and will be encountered elsewhere as this epidemic uh, advances are tremendous and unprecedented. And so using something like community health workers in partnership with Unite Us, we created a volunteer registry. We have 3,000 students, nurses, doctors, dentists, um, social workers who have volunteered to help uh, to help uh, to use phone banks to get people to resources they need. But I think we really have to think about that. And our Office of Public Health, we're fortunate that we have 64 parish or county health units. And those individuals right now are not doing the normal uh, vaccine and uh, family planning type of work they do. They actually are staffing the command center and helping to deploy resources throughout the state. And so I think this is a real uh, wake up call for states that don't have that type of public health resource that local public health is extremely important. And when you don't have those lo local trusted public health leaders, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers on the ground in communities that are vulnerable, you really lose out. And we had lost a lot in the general administration. In fact, 500 nurses were let go, but fortunately we have what we have and it's been a game changer here. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. That's, you know, you made some important points. I mean, we've talked about how we apply these ethical and legal standards in, in hospitals, and we've also looked at congregate settings like prisons or nursing homes. But um, we have to remember that the, the vast bulk of people are sheltering in place. They're in stay-at-home orders. Um, many of them are vulnerable. Many of them need care. And we need to think about how we can triage care for them um, and not just physical care for their health conditions, but also mental health and, emer and, and emotional help. I think are, these are really um, critical. Um, so the next right. question, yes, please just jump in. Let me just, yeah, let me, I, one of the things you said, I think it bears emphasis, which is um, the health system that we have. And, you know, you, you, we all know this, but I'll, I'll say it out loud. I, I was on a call earlier today with a colleague in the UK and talk, talking about what we were facing. And, and he said, you know, the NHS will just move ventilators from one place to another as they're needed where the outbreak demands. And, and it, you know, makes the point that what we call a health system is quite different than what health systems are like around the rest of the world. And it's shining a light, a very, I would say harsh light on some of the um, aspects of what is our fragmented, healthcare system and the kinds of things that we, Rebecca and you are talking about in terms of the fragility of this safety net for mm -hmm. things like housing and food security and providing healthcare. So uh, all by way of an observation rather than something we ought to do, but maybe we learn from this, um, what we're going through and, and, and do better going forward. Yeah, you know, we've, we've never seen anything quite like this. Um, uh, and, you know, with the sheer scale of what we're seeing, not just the health consequences, but the, uh, the vulnerability and the social isolation um, in, in various settings, whether it's um, long-term care, hospital care, acute care, um, or in the home or homeless shelters. These, these are critical things. Um, and yet at the same time, Larry, just a quick point. This has the potential to be transformative for American medical care and the use of telemedicine and the leveraging of right. uh, many other techniques, you know, to deliver medical care. And I'm, I'm profoundly concerned about some of the chronic illness care that's not happening and even some of the acute illness care that isn't mm -hmm. happening because of COVID. People not seeking care for their chest pain, for their stroke symptoms, yeah. for mm -hmm. other things they need to be seeking care for. So we have challenge, but also opportunity, you know, to redesign things essentially for the future here. So John, uh, yeah. I just want to weigh in, in Louisiana, we've had a 30% decrease in some hospitals in stroke and MI presentation, which is highly concerning. So in reinforcing your point. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we know, and uh, 
from epidemics from Ebola to, to any of the other major epidemics is that actually more people die of ongoing conditions than they do of the disease, the focused disease itself. And so that's a really very important reminder. And the other thing um, that um, uh, uh, you said was really critically important is, is that we're going to have to learn from this because one day COVID-19 will be over and we're going to have to restructure things. We'll have to restructure our, our health system, our hospital system, um, uh, the way uh, we do remote medicine, um, and also the kind of social and income supports that we give um, to our vulnerable populations. So these are really um, you know, crucial um, ideas. Let me, um, this next one is, is uh, for Rebecca to start, um, but anybody can jump in. Um, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned that training and guidelines are needed for clinicians to step into emergency roles. Can that happen in real time, soon enough to make a difference? Uh, could you comment on medical and other health professional students coming into high intensity situations? So we've had big challenges that we created this volunteer network in partnership with UL, our University in Lafayette and LSU and 3000 people signed up, 2000 of them health professional students and we're really having challenges with schools um, and facilities, for example, our convention center not wanting students there, worried about PPE, um, worried about exposure. So I think we, we need to do a better job. Certainly uh, the accrediting bodies, ACGME and AAMC can work to come up with guidelines for what is an appropriate uh, role for a medical student, for a nursing student, for a PA, you know, and let's, let's get that done. There's no reason to delay that. And we have lots of uh, folks who are sitting at home now who could be doing, um, you know, including our fourth year medical students, many of them, you know, NYU graduated early, ours are here. We were worried about them not having malpractice and, and some other considerations. And so why can't they be doing some of this? Why can't individuals who are getting ready to start residencies or, or who are you know, off um, duty right now be doing some drilling? So I don't see any reason why this couldn't start now. And, and many parts of this country are not under extremists like we were over the past two weeks and we need to be prepared. And again, the, prop, the one thing I've learned and, and I'm sure Nikki could reinforce this is that one of the things you see in a crisis is this false scarcity mentality. You see, I saw it in September 11th when we emptied the hospital um, when I was doing my sub eye thinking that you'd have tons of trauma patients coming and they never came and we actually put really vulnerable people in the community who didn't need to be there. Um, and in Baton Rouge where we had shelters and we were giving people medications out of whatever stock um, that might not have been safe thinking oh they won't have it first and there was a Walgreens a mile and a half away. So we've got to be able to be logical when these things happen and planful and have these things planned ahead of time. And, and that's exactly what should be happening in parts of the country now that are not yet hit and in parts of the country that have been past their peak. Thanks. We, we've only got a few minutes, so I'm gonna summarize a few questions. And then if each of you just gives us say 30 second takeaway, um, you know, one is, you know, how can we embed a local and cultural values um, into these decisions, um, whether we can offer any, um, uh, resources for clinicians to learn about the ethics of crisis standards of care. And then finally, and most importantly, and we've raised this before, but um, as we uh, learn from this and we think um, toward the future, um, uh, what is the biggest um, takeaway that you've got about um, what knowledge we've gained, what lessons we've learned and what we can do in the future? Um, so why don't we take 30 seconds from each of you um, Perhaps uh, uh, John, Rebecca, and then Jeff. Wow, thirty seconds. Okay, yeah, I think sorry. we've learned. I think we've learned that the 2012 principles that, that the IOM outlined, you know, fairness, transparency, proportionality, accountability, all those things are absolutely critical. And the conversation with the community and determining their priorities, you know, now and as we go into the future, is absolutely critical. And trying to diffuse uh, the care that we provide across as much of a region as possible, 
uh, and use those resources maximally and consistently and have the clinicians applying a uniform set of criteria and in a systems way so that they're not burdened with that moral injury at the bedside of having to make tough choices. I think all of those things, the strength of those principles and those practices has been emphasized throughout this. And we want to continue to emphasize our commitment to fairness and equity uh, and all of those values across the community as we go through this and beyond. Thank you. Um, and Rebecca, what, are, what, are, what do you think are the, the top lessons we've learned um, to make us better prepared in the future? Well, I, I think it's, a, it, it's, I guess it, it's a shock to me, but it shouldn't be that we were unprepared. We were grossly unprepared for this, that we did not have supply of ventilators. We didn't have a plan for PPE. We had not done the kind of drills. Um, we hadn't thought about where things were being sourced from, you know, running out of swabs because they were made in Northern Italy. So now we can't test patients. I mean, all of these things um, are things I hope, hopefully we'll learn from, from planfulness, number one. Number two is public health, the de public health disinvestments and the lack of support for public health. We are paying the price for it. I mean, the CARES Act, there is a, a tremendous trillions of dollars will be spent on this. Many people will die. You know, we had had better systems of surveillance and testing. Some of this, much of this probably could have been avoidable. Shame on us if we don't fix it going forward. And if we don't invest in the types of people and public health infrastructure that help us deal with these types of pandemics because they are not ending. It's a global world. You're in Wuhan one day and Wisconsin the next. Um, and then finally, I think some are surprised by, but shouldn't be that this is really um, a stress test showing the disparities and the inequalities in our society and that healthcare should be, uh, in my view, and hopefully in others, a human right, but that even if you don't believe that, that the health of one person impacts the health of entire communities, and even for that reason alone, for selfish reasons, we should want the American public to be healthy and help support efforts that bolster health, whether through healthcare or, or efforts that promote healthy communities. So I think all Thanks. of that are, all of those things are important learnings. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Jeff, you are, um, you're our last uh, takeaway. Um, before I turn it back over to Nikki to conclude. Great, thanks, and I'll, I'll be quick. What, one, just to reiterate, public health planning matters. We've learned that in spades. We can coordinate rapidly when we need to, which has been a really interesting lesson to me. So things that you seemed insurmountable and would take uh, weeks or months can happen now within hours and days when it needs to. And then the last thing I'll say is the, the um, idea about community priorities that John mentioned, I think is really interesting. Um, but I think it, it's, we're seeing that people think a little differently as we're living through this than they did in prospect. So I think there'll be some good work to be done in, in retrospect, learning from this to, so that we can embed community values into the, the next time we need to plan for this. Well, that's wonderful. I, I just want to thank uh, John, Rebecca, and Jeff for uh, you know, wonderfully educational and, and vital uh, discussion about how we get through this um, a pandemic uh, with, an, with the intact and functioning health system. I also want to thank the academies and the American Public Health Association and um, uh, turn it over to Nikki with, with our thanks for um, uh, uh, planning and leading this, Nikki. Over to you for the final concluding remarks. Great. Well, thank you. And let me just reiterate my thanks to you, Larry, and to the, the panelists and all of the staff um, and our advisory committee who really helped to plan this. You know, as I have listened to this incredibly rich and, and robust conversation, you know, I, I think back to many of the things um, that, that I used to talk about uh, when I was in government and that I still really firmly believe. And the first thing I would say is the good response is built on the back of strong day-to-day -day systems. You respond with the system you have in hand, not the system that you wish you had in hand. And so as I think about this conversation, I think about in our strong day-to-day -day system, are we always providing the best care possible? I think we probably have to say in many circumstances, the answer is no. In our strong day-to-day -day system, are we always stewarding scarce resources? You know, I volunteer in a community clinic where resources are scarce and I see lots of probably not very necessary tests get done all the time. So the answer there is probably we have room for improvement. John and I have worked together on a number of shortages day to day, not things that ever required crises, 
whether it's a shortage of blood or a shortage of normal saline or a shortage of an anesthesia medicine or anything else. I think what we've seen there is that institutions that have come together and thought about how not to get into a crisis, but plan, make these contingency plans and conserve and reuse and substitute, those, those folks that have put those day-to-day -day systems in place seem to have a leg up in dealing with the very difficult situations that we have now. Um, a strong day-to-day -day system does better if you have a structure. And so we've talked about, and John talked about, working through an ICS structure in this kind of a situation. And that one of the things that that does as well is it helps mitigate the panic and I think the rush to crisis standards of care. You have to go or you ought to go through the contingency process before you get to crisis. Um, strong day-to-day -day systems know their communities in advance and incorporate their communities into planning and execution. And strong day-to-day -day systems do everything they can to ensure equity. It's not just about a ventilator here, but we know it's about PPE, it's about testing. It's about people who have to stay at work, driving buses, working in grocery stores, et cetera, and thinking about now equity as we think about who's going to be able to return to work, right? And are you going to need a test? Are you going to have to pass certain other requirements? What's going to happen here? There's a lot of equity considerations still ahead of us um, that we need to think about. You know, I think we all know that no plan, no matter how good it is, survives first contact with the enemy, but it sure is easier if you thought through these circumstances before than if this is the first time you are thinking about crisis standards of care. And then finally, um, while we would not have wished this disaster on anyone anywhere in the world, never let a good crisis go to waste. And so, as I think we've heard, I mean, we're all impressed by the amazing creativity we've seen, the amazing state and local and institutional leadership we've seen. And as John said, this is an opportunity for us to think about important aspects of redesign, whether it's we're on the cusp of something that looks closer to universal coverage, that we can expand access through health system reform and through telemedicine, through other sorts of things. But there's tremendous opportunity here. Um, and it's probably a good thing for us all to be thinking uh, about that as well. So with that, I'll just say that this all concludes today's webinar. Our next webinar will be next Wednesday, April 22nd, again at five, and we'll focus on COVID-19 and testing uh, and what this next generation of testing might look like. Everyone who registered for the webinar will receive an invitation to the next one. And for those of you who, who miss parts of this or want to share this with friends, this webinar has been recorded. And as I said in the beginning, the recording, a transcript, and slide presentations will be made available on the website, covid19conversations.org. Again, thank you so much to our panelists, to APHA, to NAM for sponsoring this series. And thanks to our listeners for joining us today. Stay healthy and safe. Take care. <laughs>